வரை நேரம் பைபிள் ஆவர் பிரசென்டட் பை தி நேஷனல் பைபிள் காலேஜ் கிறிஸ்துவின் சபையார் உங்களை வாழ்த்துகிறார்கள் வாயேசு அண்டை வாயேசு அண்டை வாணவரேசு ஞானமாய் உலகில் தானம் அளித்தாரே தம் ஜீவனை தானம் அளித்தாரே தானம் அளித்தாரே தம் ஜீவனை தானம் அளித்தாரே Welcome to Stepping Stones from God's Word. Hosted by John R. Vaughn of the Gray Mirror Church of Christ. The next few minutes are designed to help you with everyday living, finding our answers from God's Word. And now, John Vaughn. I've said it many times, but I always appreciate uh, the opportunity that you give me to come into your home or to your place of, of dwelling and and to study the Bible with me. And I, I just really enjoy that and count it an honor that you give me that opportunity. And so this time that we're together for the next few moments, uh, I want to raise a question. Actually, it's a question that Jesus asked. And boy, it is one of the most important questions that you or I will ever be asked. It's found in the 8th chapter of Mark. It's the 36th verse. And the Lord said here, What doth it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and forfeit his life or his soul. For what shall a man give in exchange for his life? You know, one of the remarkable things about the Bible is that often it just speaks volumes in one verse. And I think that's true of this particular verse. In this brief statement, uh, it's just a verse, but it speaks volumes as far as the importance of it is concerned. And what I, I hope we can do during the next moment or two is to look at several things Uh, that are suggested by this statement or question that Jesus asks. What doth it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? First of all, it, it suggests that the Lord recognizes that man has a soul. That uh, man's different from the animals of the world. That living within this fleshly body, there is a soul that's not ever going to, to die. Uh, it's when the soul and the body separate when the soul leaves the body that man dies. James talks about that in James 2.26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, even so faith apart from works is dead. So James doesn't say that the spirit dies when there's this separation of body and spirit, but he said the flesh, the body uh, dies. And then he, the Bible points out that God is the father of our spirits, and that like God, our spirits are not ever going to die. Uh, look with me at a statement made over in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. It's, uh, it's verse 9. I hope you have your Bible with you, and, and uh, as we read these passages, if you'll read them with us, or, or at least jot them down and maybe look at them a little later yourself. But uh, here's, here's a very interesting statement. He said, We had fathers of our flesh to chasten us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we, much, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And so there he makes that distinction. We have fleshly body fathers and we have a spiritual father. Now infidels tell us that we don't have a soul, that man doesn't have a soul. And when he dies, he's like a, well, like a dog. He just, just dies and that's the end of it. Or as somebody said, he's like an old rover. When he dies, he dies all over. Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm thankful I'm not an infidel. I'm thankful the Lord tells us that we have an eternal soul. And in this statement, Jesus recognizes that. And you know, one of the phenomenal things about that is that uh, we're going to, in eternity, have as much time on our hands as does Almighty God. So, at the very outset in this statement, Jesus recognizes that we are a living soul, an eternal soul. But there's a second thing that's suggested here. It also implies, in this statement by Jesus, And this is so sad that people can and will lose their soul. Uh, Jesus said they would. 
And really the, the tragedy of it is that he said most will lose their souls because they're going down the broad way. Listen to the Lord himself. Matthew 7, beginning with the 13th verse. Enter ye in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many are they that, that enter in thereby. For narrow is the gate and straighten the way that leadeth unto life, and few are they that find it. Now, it's not a pleasant thought at all that so many people are going to go down to eternal destruction uh, and, and are going to be lost. And sometimes when bad things happen, people want to blame it on God. But if I'm lost eternally, it's not going to be God's fault. God's done so much. John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He, he loved humanity so much that He gave His only Son. Or 1 Timothy 2.4, when He said that He wanted us all to come to the knowledge of the truth to be saved. If I'm lost, it's not going to be the fault of the Lord Jesus. Jesus has done so much. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He were rich, that is, He was in heaven with God, though He were rich, yet for your sake He became poor, that ye through His poverty might become rich. Not talking about material richness, riches, but have that eternal home with Him in heaven. Or again, 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that the Lord is long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not the Lord Jesus' fault if I'm lost. Neither is it the fault of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has wonderfully revealed God's love to us, God's mercy, God's plan of salvation for us. It's revealed to us the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. The Holy Spirit has, has made it possible for us to know what to do to be saved. If I'm lost, it's going to be my fault and my fault alone. If you are lost, it's going to be your fault, your fault alone. Because we have the, the, uh, the Lord's love, the love of the Lord Jesus, His sacrifice, and what the Holy Spirit has done. And then God has made each of us, created us with the power to reason. He's given us an intellect. He's given us the ability to, to understand. He's given us the ability to make choices. And the choices that we make in life are going to, uh, those decisions that we make are going to determine our destiny, our eternal destiny. And, there's, and, and as the Lord makes this statement, it also implies to us that there is nothing compared to losing one's soul. Sometimes people lose their fortune. and we, We've probably all heard about and read about people back during the Great Depression days who lost their fortunes and some committed suicide, leaping from windows of buildings and killing themselves, just couldn't live without their, their money, their material things. Well, it's sad when we would lose material things. Sometimes people have lost their houses, maybe stand out in the yard and just watch their house go up in flames and all the things that they treasure within that house. That's sad. That's tragic. Sometimes people lose loved ones. And it's so hard to lose a, a, a mate or a child or a parent. That's, that's sad. Sometimes men lose their lives in automobile accidents or in some other unexpected tragic way. And that's, that's also quite sad. But those losses, as bad as they are, are just don't even begin to compare with losing your soul. You can lose, and I can lose all these material things and yet save our souls and be rich and happy as far as eternity is concerned. But now there's something else implied in this statement. And that is, man doesn't have to lose his soul. Many are going to, he says, but you don't have to. You can save your soul. And now what Peter told the people on Pentecost, these people who realized that they had crucified the Son of God, and they said, what shall we do? And in the second chapter of Acts, in the 40th verse, Peter's reply, save yourselves from this crooked generation. That is, save yourself from this, the fate of this wicked generation. And Jesus said in Matthew 11, in verse 28, come unto me, all ye that labor, and I'll give you rest. Well, these statements obviously teach us that a man uh, does not have to lose his soul, 
that he can accept the invitation of Jesus and, and that he can be saved. And as he saves it, he, he saves himself. But uh, man cannot serve God and, and the world at the same time. The way the Bible puts it, you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and, and the world or material things. You have to give up one or the other. You have to make a choice. And the, when you stop and think about it, the only thing, the only thing that can keep us out of heaven is sin. And no one but self, when you stop and think about it, can keep us out of heaven. Because we're the one who determines whether or not we're going to sin. Sin's the only thing there is that can keep us out of that e eternal home. But now, the Lord's statement here, what shall a man be profited if he should gain the whole world and forfeit his life, forfeit his soul? It also is warning us against the danger of exchanging our soul for something that's basically worthless. Like Esau, who sold his birthright for a mess of pottage, the Bible says. He was hungry. And all he could see was the here and the now, not down the road. And he gave up his birthright. And later he cried and begged for it, but... It was too late. He had given it up. He would given his birthright up for something that was basically worthless. Or sometimes businessmen will just spend all their time on their business and say they don't have time for religion. They don't have time to, to serve God. If you're too busy to serve God, you're too busy. Like sometimes people even love false doctrine more than they, they love the truth. The Lord talks about that as well. And sometimes people sell their souls for the sake of just bad company. They just enjoy running around with a certain group of people. Paul said evil companionships corrupt good, good morals. But what the Lord is saying to us here, whatever it is that you allow to cause you to be lost eternally is, is just going to be worthless in, in the long run. It'll compare, look, look is nothing. I wish young people could learn while they are in those younger years, those early years of their lives, could learn the, the, the value of, true, of truth, true values in life. And uh, I remember uh, my little boy was just a little fella, and he could hold up a nickel in one hand and a shiny penny in the other hand and say, uh, you know, here, here, here's a nickel, and he'd push it out of the way and take that shiny penny. He'd take the thing that was worth less look good to him. And a lot of people will exchange their souls, put it on the balance. Here, here are the pleasures of sin, and there is pleasure in sin. Here are the worldly things, and here's eternity. And sometimes they say, well, I'll take, I'll take the here and now. I'll take what will give me pleasure right now. And, and not do like Moses who looked under the recompense of reward. Well, it's a great statement the Lord has made here, isn't it? What shall a man give in exchange if he were to gain the, not just all the gold, not just all the silver, not just all the money, but if he were to gain the whole world. But at the same time, he'd lose his soul. Well, he's saying you don't have to lose, you can lose your soul, you don't have to lose your soul. You can be saved if you live the Lord's kind of life and obey him. Well, take your Bible, you, you study it for yourself. Don't take my word or anybody else's word for it. Uh, your soul's too valuable, too valuable depend to the words of any man. And that's why God's given us each a Bible and He said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Always a pleasure. Thank you for letting me be with you today. In just a few moments, we're going to return to the panel and the questions that have been sent in. But uh, first, let me tell you about a beautifully illustrated Bible correspondence course. We'd like to send to you free of charge. Lesson one, uh, includes the story of creation, the first sin, the great flood, and it continues with the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, Joseph, and finally the deliverance of God's people from Egyptian slavery. Lesson two includes the heartaches and misery caused by Israel's wandering 40 years before they finally reach the promised land. It includes the story of the kings of Israel, the ends and ends with a brief account of the life of Jesus. Lesson three includes the death and resurrection of Jesus, the beginning of the church, and how the early disciples were Christians only. Lesson four centers on God's love and concern for mankind, Jesus' plan of redemption, and it gives us an example of Bible conversions. It deals with a great question, 
What must I do to be saved? Lesson 5 includes fascinating history regarding the church. It ends with a plea to return to God's way as revealed in the New Testament. It deals with a way that we can all be united in Christ Jesus. We'd love to send it to you. Just write to the church office. Give us a call or, or email us and we'll send it to you free of charge. I've heard many of you say, those of you who do watch this program on a regular basis, uh, how much you enjoy this question and answer period. I too enjoy it and learn a lot. Thankful for these men who study the Bible and can give us answers uh, to Bible questions. And so during the next few moments, we're going to take some questions that have been submitted and then take the Bible and uh, try to give a Bible answer. And we are very blessed today to have two men who know the Bible well. They've spent years in study of it, uh, very dedicated and uh, so appreciative of their giving their time. Brother David Davison, who preaches for the Cathy's Creek congregation, is to my far left. David, always a pleasure to get to work with you. you know. And uh, then Joe Williams. Joe is from Lawrenceburg, and he preaches for the good Pulaski Street Church there. Joe, thank you for joining us. Now, the first question we're going to have today is one uh, that we'll address to Brother David Davison. Uh, this person asks, who, who uh, were the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans, John, were pretty well an obscure group. There's little known really about the Nicolaitans. They're only mentioned in one chapter in the Bible, and that's Revelation chapter 2. Uh, whenever uh, the letter was written to the church at Ephesus, uh, Jesus mentions, Thou hast those that hate the, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then we notice Pergamum, he mentions that they hated the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And that's the only time we find them mentioned uh, in the scriptures. Now, uh, origin, uh, ancient scholars attributed Nicholas, a deacon in the church in Jerusalem, according to, to the to Jews, as uh, being the founder of the Nicolaitans. But that's pretty well been disproven. Now, it's thought that the Nicolaitans were a group that uh, believed it was all right to um, uh, eat meat offered to idols uh, in their workplaces. Uh, every uh, a craft had a, a guild, and each guild had its own deity. And each week they would have a meal uh, with which they offered the food to the deity and this sort and then they ate this food that had been offered to this particular deity, uh, thinking this, of course, would uh, uh, help them in their work and so forth. And then after this, uh, they began to engage in all types of immoral practices. Nicolaitans, uh, apparently, or at least it is thought, uh, said, well, it's all right to do this. If you're going to condemn sin, you need to learn what sin is. And God's not going to hold it against you because you're already a child of His. Uh, so go ahead and participate. And uh, then uh, uh, you'll be all right because you're already a child of God. And of course, this would undermine the very structure of Christianity, the morality of Christianity. And so Jesus says, you hate it and I also hate it. Thank you. That, that's an interesting background to that. Thank you, David. Uh, Joe. This, this is a, a, a person who said, I've lived 70 years and tried to live a good life, but sometimes I become trouble when you mention being baptized as I've never been. Will this keep me out of heaven? Let me tell you what's going to keep you out of heaven. Sin. Sin's what's going to keep you out of heaven. Sin is the problem. And you say, well, I've tried to live a good life. I've tried to, by self-control, do certain things, not do certain things, got this checklist, you know. I don't, I don't cheat on my wife, I don't cheat on my taxes, I don't cuss, drink, smoke. You got this whole list, and I go to church, and I say my prayers, but I've never been baptized. See, what keeps you out of heaven is sin. And you can't have a big enough checklist, do enough things, have enough self-control to refrain from other things to fix the problem of sin. You know, I love the book of Hebrews, one of my favorite books in the whole Bible because the subject's Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you how He's better than all these other things. He's better than the angels. He's a better lawgiver than Moses. He offers a better rest than Joshua. He offers better promises, better covenant. He's a better high priest. 
But one of my favorite verses is Hebrews 12 and verse 24, where it says that the blood of Christ speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Well, here's a question. What does the blood of Christ say? Well, first, the blood of Christ says, I'm guilty of sin. See, think about it. If I could just keep the law, if I could just be good, if I just had a checklist, if I just did the Ten Commandments, and I could be right with God, why did Jesus have to shed His blood? See, that's an argument made over in Galatians chapter 3 by Paul. See, the first thing the blood of Christ says is that I've sinned. The second thing that the blood of Christ says is I can't save myself. What could I do? What could I possibly do to be right with a holy God? How could I approach Him? Uh, just because I just refrained myself from doing certain things and done other things and, like you put it, tried to be good? See, it's interesting that we think that way. You know, the Bible's full of that, whether it's uh, Pharisees or whether it's those who wanted to keep the law or legalism. And Paul writes about that on one occasion that I think is pertinent. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 1, he said this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, prayer to God for Israel, is that you may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Now listen to this, verse 3. It says, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, listen, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now, over in a verse we probably know in Romans, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. And then the next verse says, For in it is revealed the righteousness of God. And essentially, how God makes a man righteous. Not by his merit, not by his work, not by trying to do good, but by the blood of Jesus. And it's when I'm baptized that I contact that blood. You know, sometimes we sing that song, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But here's the important question. When? Acts 22 and verse 16. Why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Yes, it'll keep you out of heaven because you're still stained with that stain of sin if it's not washed away in the blood of the Lamb when you're baptized. Just reference Acts 2 and verse 38 or Colossians 2 verse 11 through 13 there where we see the old man of sin is washed away when I'm baptized. Excellent, Joe. All right, David. Uh, why, why do some women wear a cloth on their heads during worship? That goes back to an ancient practice, John, whenever uh, women had to wear uh, uh, a veil or covering over their heads to show that they were in subjection to their husbands. Uh, this was found throughout the entire biblical world. It appears though that in Corinth uh, some of, uh, of the problem had arisen. Some women apparently were not wearing the covering on their heads. Uh, and uh, so Paul addresses this uh, and remember this, it was, uh, as we'll notice later, it was a custom. Uh, if a woman uh, appeared in public without her head covered, she was not honoring her husband. And uh, if a married woman appeared in public that way, uh, then she was taken and her hair was cut off, her head was shaved, and she was shown to be an immoral woman. Since that was the predominant custom, certainly then Christian women uh, would not want to appear in public or in worship without their heads covered because they would be dishonoring their husband. And how could they worship God acceptably if they were, dis uh, if they were not honoring their head, which is the husband? So it, it appeared to be a problem there. But we notice in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 16, uh, Paul says, if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. In other words, we have no such custom as going without it. Now, in our society today, uh, we do not look upon uh, a woman as being uh, dishonoring her husband without having her head covered. And inasmuch as Paul mentions it as a custom, then... Uh, uh, it's not something that we are bound to do because it's not looked upon in our society as being dishonorable to the husband and thus uh, a hindrance to her in her Christian life. So um, now, is it, all, is it is the woman sinning and wearing a uh, uh, covering overhead? No, but she shouldn't try to bind it on others because as we mentioned, it was a custom. 
David, you explained that that well. Appreciate that. All right, um, Joe, what what does the Bible say to people who live together as husband and wife, but who have never been formally married? Well, one thing we know, it's not how God planned it. All you got to do is read the first couple of chapters of the Bible. And we see a man's to leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's how God designed it. But we also see that it, it doesn't go with God's expectations. I want you to look at a verse of me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 34, note this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, note verse 34. It says, There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman... You see that? You catch that? We don't even have to read the rest. The idea is married, and then unmarried and virgin are the same thing. See, God has an expectation that we won't engage in sexual activities outside of the institution of marriage. That's how He designed it. I think the most important verse for this is we ask the question, hey, if we're going to live together as husband and wife, but we're not actually married, is the idea of the sin of fornication. See, if we look over in Hebrews chapter 13, there's a very important verse in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 that addresses this. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. Now, does that mean the mattress and box springs? My son would go, no. See, it doesn't mean the actual bed. It's a euphemism to talk about the sexual relationship within marriage. And it's honorable. No problem with it. It doesn't defile you at all. It's how God designed it. But if we read the rest of the verse, it says it's honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Fornication, having sex without being married. Adultery, having sex while you're married or the other one's married. It's the idea of having sex outside of what God ordained, the marriage. The Bible's pretty clear it's wrong. It's a sin that will condemn you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. There we find a list, and in that list it says, Do not be deceived. You won't enter the kingdom of heaven, get to go to heaven essentially. If you are guilty of these things that are listed. You know what the first one is? Fornication. The very first one. And then we see as we think about this an occasion in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 21. Where, where Paul is talking about how he's going to come back and visit the brethren in Corinth. And one of the things he says is, when I come again, I'm going to mourn for many who have, listen, not repented of fornication. What does the Bible say about fornication, sex outside of marriage? It's a sin that will condemn you, and it's a sin to be repented of. Well, what does repent mean? Literally, change your mind about it. Just to be real simple, quit doing it. That's what the Bible says. Joe, that couldn't be much plainer. Uh, certainly goes against the uh, popular ideas of our day, though, doesn't it? Sure enough. Uh, several things you touched on there are just uh, so foreign to the way the Bible teaches. And I guess a lot of the problem that our society is facing today is that uh, we, um, we just don't believe the Bible or don't know what it says. So thank you for both of you for going back to that. Uh, I've really enjoyed this period together today, studying the Bible, and uh, you know, it doesn't always say what we want it to say, but if we're really concerned about doing what the Lord wants us to do, uh, then, then we will study it and we'll try to follow it. But uh, we've tried to do that today. Thank both of you for the time that you've spent in studying and coming and being here today and answering these questions. And uh, we appreciate you folks who've watched this program and joining us by television. And we would encourage you and invite you to come worship with us. Uh, the three congregations where we uh, worship, you'd be most welcome at any one of them. Thank you for being with us today. Let me tell you about a beautifully illustrated Bible correspondence course. We'd like to send to you free of charge. Lesson one uh, includes the story of creation, the first sin, the great flood. Lesson two includes the heartaches and misery caused by Israel's wandering 40 years before they finally reach the promised land. Lesson three includes the death and resurrection of Jesus, the beginning of the church. Lesson four centers on God's love and concern for mankind, Jesus' plan of redemption, and it gives us an example of Bible conversions. Lesson five includes fascinating history regarding the church. We'd love to send it to you. Just write to the church office. Give us a call or, or email us, and we'll send it to you free of charge. Great Mirror Church of Christ is a congregation of Christians who believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. 
Following the New Testament pattern, we're trying to meet the needs of the people in this community and throughout the world. We invite you to worship with us at Graymere Church of Christ, which meets at 1320 Trotwood Avenue in Columbia, Tennessee. You'll always receive a warm welcome. If you have a question or comment about today's program, call 931-388-4796. We hope you will join us again next week as we study the Bible. தொடர்பு கொள்ள வேண்டிய முகவரி திருமறை நேரம் ஐம்பத்தி எட்டு சர்ச் தெரு குமர நகர் சென்னை ஆறு லட்சத்தி எண்பத்தி உமக்கு பானவர் யார் உமக்கு பானவர் யார் உமக்கு